Okay. Welcome, everybody, in the uh, Northeast Kingdom, uh, a.k.a. the Texas of Vermont, uh, and all our uh, 11 uh, subscribing towns up here. Uh, we're in the studio today in Newport, and we have the privilege of uh, interviewing uh, Gerald Malloy, who was uh, hot off the debate stage last night. And um, in case you don't know, he's running for uh, running for the U.S. Senate. And uh, if he wins, uh, he uh, he'll be our first Republican since Jim Jeffords. Um, and uh, so we'd like to show a nice Northeast Kingdom welcome to uh, Gerald Malloy. How are you? I'm great, sir. Uh, Steve, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me on the show here. And uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody up in the Northeast Kingdom. Beautiful part of the world. Yeah, yeah, I uh I moved up here 20 years ago. I I found a place. Uh, I, I looked all over the state. I almost bought a place uh, right near the the uh, uh, the tra Long Trail in Stanford, and uh, that fell through. And it was land, trailers, and everything. And I found this place in the village. And I did not want to live in the village, any village. But lo and behold, it was a good deal. Uh, they they wanted 20 grand. <laughs> the pipes had popped. It was all. Uh, it was a beat up rental. And um, so I offer, uh, they wanted 20 grand. I offered them 18. They took it, threw another 20 into it. But uh, anyways, uh, could you give us a brief uh, bio? I, I, I know you've got some uh, 22 years in the military. Sure. Uh, it start off. Uh, you grew up outside of Boston like I did. I was a little further out. Uh, okay. Tell us about yourself. Sure. Born in Boston, uh, oldest of nine, had one uh, brother passed away very young, but uh, uh, greater Boston area, grew up, uh, went to West Point at 18, uh, graduated West Point, played some hockey and baseball up there, uh, and did 22 years in the Army all over the world. Uh, I'm a veteran, and uh, after the Army, um, uh, well, going back to Desert Shield, Desert Storm, that was kind of a big event. I fired 644 MLRS rockets uh, 640 MLR sucks uh, in Desert Storm. Um, uh, there was, after the military, did five years working uh, with different government agencies. Um, and then the last 11 and a half, and have been in business, uh, earned an MBA along the way, and uh, another graduate uh, certificate degree from Georgetown along the way. But um, been in business providing services to government, or mostly government organizations, mostly the military uh, down in Washington, D.C. Uh, moved up here to Perkinsville, a little bit off the beaten path, beautiful area. I'm looking out at uh, Mount Escutney over there uh, a little over two years ago. Yeah, a little over two years ago. Um, so I have four, four children, uh, three in Vermont schools. One is a uh, senior up at St. John's Bay right now, Hilltopper. Uh, actually went to the, uh, the big game, uh, just this past weekend. And here we are. And uh, about a year ago, almost a year ago, November, it was the middle of November. Senator Leahy made his announcement and I saw that on my phone and I said, hmm. I could do this. And, uh, I've kind of gone from could run, should run, uh, you know, have to run to have to win because I, I've seen our country go downhill. I'm not a career politician, but I, I offer 42 years of service uh, uh, one way or another. And um, I think I'm the right person for the job. And uh, I didn't like who I saw go I would be going up against. Uh, and I think our country needs to kind of kind of turn around, go in a different direction. So that's why I'm running. And I appreciate you having me on. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for being with us. That's one of the things I noticed uh, from watching the debate. Uh, I missed it last night, but I watched it uh, 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 toe to tail uh, about uh, an hour ago. One of the starkest differences between you and Peter Welch uh, is that he seems to have a government solution for everything. And, you know, I, I think that like Calvin Coolidge, you know, I mean, th that that governs least governs best. Uh, and, and I was thinking about this on the way in. Um, I, I was a, a tool and dime banker for years and years. And one of the projects, it was a government project I worked on, was uh, the experimental fusion reactor uh, with the Department of Energy at General Atomics out in La Jolla, California. And it was the biggest boondoggle. And, you know, I, I would ask these guys, like, even if you do uh, get it up to 100 million degrees, you know, uh, you know, by they were shooting neutron uh, neutron beams into a tokamak reactor. It was a, like a, a giant magnetic donut. And uh, I said, even if you do get it up, how are you going to sustain the reaction? 
Uh, uh, what's the guarantee you're not going to crack a hole in time and space? But I mean, I, it was government. It was a good idea, but they, you know, like you said, the private institutions and universities are doing it now still. But this was a government deal, and it was wasted billions and billions of dollars. Mm. And and he was talking about uh, just government solutions for everything, you know. Yeah, um, I I did hear a lot of that, and I, unfortunately. You know, it wasn't so much of a debate type forum, but uh, golly, I, you know, you hear a lot of spin in the answers. And um, I mean, even for instance, he had talked about defunding the police and, and he kind of turned that around as though he were in support of the police, which, you know, he, he voted to remove qualified immunity. We, we remove qualified immunity. We don't have a police force. And that's, you know, I've talked about. My view of the Constitution, which I carry around with me, is, uh, uh, you know, just enough order so we can all enjoy the liberty, rights and freedoms of the Constitution and less government. I'm seeing way too much government involved. And I hear it. I hear it every day. Big business, small business, farmers, same thing. Stay out of my business. I can do it better. I can do it faster. I don't need all this regulation and and burden uh, and and, and even subsidy because, um, you know, taxpayers don't need to be paying for that. You know, he was talking about, uh, uh, you know, government funding uh, for, for local police. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. All these localities, the cities and states and the different municipalities and stuff, they they dropped the funding after the, uh, the George Floyd thing. And uh, and now he's talking about making up for that with government money. And it's like, well, wait a minute. New York City is saving billions of dollars. Uh, they can't. They have a hard time retaining police because uh, New York City only pays like seventy-five grand. They can move out to Long Island and make double that. And you know, it, it's like it was the cities and states that defund them. It wasn't a federal defunding effort. Yeah. So why should all of us taxpayers be forced to pay for you know uh, to reinstate well, the police? Well, that was that was part of the spin because that. That was a that was kind of a ploy late in the election. We're in an election, you know, campaign season, so that was just kind of a ploy to make it look like uh, his party was supportive of law enforcement. That was never going to go anywhere, but it just it was an appearance type thing. So, uh, you know, and that's been going on a lot. I, um, I I can tell you though, you know, campaigning uh, boots on the ground since January. So, you know, when Senator Lee, he made his announcement, I went uh, to pretty much January and February of this past year, I visited uh, quite a bit of Vermont. And I just got a feel and it continues to stay. I think it's grown to this day. The Vermont is ready for change. And the most, you know, what's really is I tried to point this out last night. And I'm not sure if I did a good enough job, but I mean, Vermonters are, you know, their primary fo- concern is inflation, uh, crime, drugs, and education. Uh, Vermonters are not, uh, their focus is not reproductive rights, insurrection, and threat to democracy. However, I will say the threat to democracy piece is interesting because the way I look at that, it's about an ele- how your elected officials represent you. And that's where I think right now, I've talked about, I, I think the uh, progressive left has hijacked the Democrat Party and they are not representing, you know, all Vermonters, all Americans. They're, you know, way over here on the left, they are representing that agenda. You know, and that's maybe 15 percent that are really, um, you know, for instance, you know, thinking that we are, in fact, in a existential climate crisis. I, that hasn't been proved to me. I want to I want to decrease emissions and stuff. I want to have current energy, future energy, critical technology and food independence. And, and we'll get there. With industry, not with more and more government uh, control and subsidy and you know billions and uh, trillions of dollars and all that overspending, uh, you know, put a spin on it if you want. But all that overspending has put us in this in this um, inflation recession that we're in. And unfortunately, I did mention this last night, you know. Mortgage rates going from 3% to 7%. they are going to go to 10 because they're going to do another 75 basis points. That, that even adds on hundreds of billions of dollars to our debt. And then when you couple that with the decision to get rid of our oil and gas independence on day one, um, that's just, it's not, it's not reality. I mean, we, we need oil. I mean, you know, 
Oil helps make this thing. Oil makes the road you drive on. Oil makes some of your clothes. Oil makes that water bottle that you're drinking from. So, uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're, you know, we don't have the resources right now, lithium, cobalt, nickel. We don't have the processing capability. So this backing into the, the Green New Deal, New Green Deal, you know, it's just, it's not, it's not in touch with reality. No, you can't, you can't throw a car into reverse going down the highway at 50. <laughs> and they ref- it seemed like they refused to take any uh, any responsibility for stopping fossil fuels on day one and, you know, and, and then printing and just flooding the zone with cash, which right. is, you know, which, which brought on this massive inflation that we're seeing. Right. And, and it's funny you mentioned that, too, because, you know, uh, Trump kept mentioning clean coal. And, and uh, I I was thinking about that. And I, you know. And I'm thinking, well, maybe it's just a, a talking point. There's really no such thing as clean coal. But then, uh, uh, thanks to you know uh, Dave Walsh on Bannon's show and and some other, he pointed me in the right direction. So I started uh, going down that rabbit hole, and I found out that we have really cleaned up coal burning lately. So mm-hmm. that we've gotten rid of almost all the particulate matter through ESPs on the smokestacks. And, you know, and we've cut down on uh, SO2 uh, emissions uh, and nitrous oxide emissions. And, you know, and and so there really is such a thing as it's not maybe clean coal, but it's cleaner coal. And it's a bridge because like Jimmy Carter even said, we're the Saudi Arabia of coal and you hate to burn it. But, you know, geez, we've got to keep a a decent base load or we're going to lose industries. And then you mentioned the the rise in interest rates. Okay, so there goes the opportunity for younger people to uh, you know to to buy houses because uh, uh, you know they're, you're talking the average home being about three to four hundred grand, and uh, you need about fifty to eighty grand for a down payment, and it's impossible to save when your wages aren't keeping up. And then so the the housing industry and the remodeling industry grinds to a halt. And then you've got your your local contractors, which we have all around here. Uh, they're they're burdened with the cost of materials, and 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 plus everything shrinking. The war, it, so they, I really think they're going to throw us into a depression. So that there's a good news, bad news thing. The good news is we're probably going to get a change in government, which like diapers is a good thing for the same reason. Uh, but the bad news is that you, that if you do get elected. Uh, you guys are going to inherit a depression, which they will blame on you. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, I keep thinking of the statement when you're in a hole, stop digging. So we've got to get some fiscal responsibility. That is going to be challenging. And that's, uh, and it's going to be a while here because, um, you know, well, yeah. You know, you know, we're in a hole in this $31 trillion debt. And, and uh, you know, even uh, my opponent asked me last night about Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. I, I, that's not on my radar screen to 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 cut those or anything. But um, we've got to have some fiscal responsibility. We can't keep adding to that debt. Uh, it, it is sucking the energy out of our economy. Getting back to your earlier point, you know, part of the whole uh, future energy, uh, you know, transition is reliability and you know we're up here in vermont and i you know i saw 22 below this past winter and it's going to be below zero every morning for a solid 40 days and you know and and frankly uh, you know i'm not interested in paying whatever it is for the the right heat pump that might work up here so you know uh transition i look i look for all the above have an option i've talked to farmers and, and farmers saying you know i don't i don't want to go to you know, buy an electric tractor from Italy. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not doing that. And so, you know, we've got, we've got a, a ways to go here. Um, and, and, you know, I'm military and I, I can tell you, like you mentioned about government, I, I, there's, uh, I should have answered that better last night, but, you know, uh, we have adversaries out there and, uh, you know, we'll look, there's war in Europe. Um, that didn't awesome. happen when the Republican Party watched, but it's there. It did happen. So you know. yeah, that was another thing I saw him brought up. And, and and trust me on this one. I have relatives in Zaporozhia. Uh, I mean, uh, my mother's Ukrainian. And, uh, and, and you know, uh, they are th- that country is like the second or third most corrupt country on the planet. 
and we're just flooding the zone with cash over there too, with no accountability. And if I hear the word brave Ukrainians one more time, uh, I'm going to lose it. Uh, and, and they, they put the brakes on, on the peace, peace talks. Uh, we, we have, uh, no problem, uh, with the UN, um, working on a peace deal in Eth- Ethiopia right now, uh, or upcoming, but we've, you know, they just dismiss peace talks out of hand. And it's like, oh, well, you can't just let somebody roll in and gobble down another person's territory. And I hate to say this because, you know, I, I'm a supporter of Israel and I'm Jewish myself. But it, it's like, you know, Israel has taken land and annexed it and put in settlers. And, you know, uh, d- that happened. And, and the Ukrainian thing, like Bannon and a lot of other people say, the Eastern Ukrainians, they're ethnic Russians. Uh, they speak Russian primarily. Uh, they don't want, it doesn't seem they want to be linked with a corrupt Ukrainian government in the West, uh, yeah. which is leaning, always leaning towards Europe. And they, Biden even stopped the, pe- uh, the peace talks they were having. Um, <clears throat> I monitored this on my weekly news show. They were having peace talks and they, the Ukrainians were wearing their Azov battalion patches and uniforms to the peace talks which angered the russians but they were still talking peace and in april <clears throat> biden says that's it you know no more money if you're going to keep talking peace and i'm all like wait a minute and the only thing the only guarantee that putin uh, wanted and i'm no fan of putin like anyone else the guy's ex kgb you know we know his bio and how his opponents seem to disappear or wind up in prison but, you know, all Putin wanted was a guarantee that the Ukraine become uh, neutral like Switzerland and not join NATO. That's all he wanted. And he said he was going to pull back. And, and we're not talking peace, though. We can we can set up peace talks in Ethiopia and the Sudan and other conflict regions. And, you know, and here we are. We're, we've got a nasty winter coming up, more than likely. They had eight billion dollars in fuel assistance last year. Uh, and now they're talking about cutting it down to four billion when the price of fuel has doubled. And there's a lot of people they're talking about people living paycheck to paycheck. Well, you know, up here we're in a real rural area, and people aren't living paycheck to paycheck, even day to day. They're living hand to mouth, and that fuel system makes a big deal. Uh, and for them to cut it, they're going to cut it down to four billion supposedly, while we're shoveled over sixty billion which we can't account for any of it to the Ukraine, which is not in our strategic interest at all. Uh, it, it's uh, the anti-war, whatever happened to the Democratic Party and the anti-war agenda. That's all I've got to say. Well, I, you know, I, I've, I've uh, written about, you know, I've actually worked with 20 NATO partners and allies. And, I, you know, I've been in the Fulda Gap uh, in the Cold War. And I've been sure the Cold the Gap, yeah, the um, yeah, right. Uh, so, Soviet Union and, and, you know, the Warsaw Pact, you know, war didn't happen then. But uh, I look, I, you know, one of the things I talk about is trying to get on the Foreign Relations Committee and actually have some uh, effective uh, foreign policy implemented. And you're exactly right that when, when the U.S. government decided to support one way or another, um, the Ukraine, Ukraine, excuse me, Ukraine joining NATO, that has implications, long term implications. And we we haven't worked through that a lot uh, or well. Um, and then you mentioned that I don't know if I mentioned it specifically, but I, I mean, I looked. So, you know, home heating oil December 2020 was two dollars and four cents on average here in Vermont. And it's uh, right at about six now. And uh you know, I talk to people. I'm out, out campaigning all the time, and I talk to you know fuel and oil, oil and gas industry folks, and we're in a very, very vulnerable position right now. Any kind of oil shock could be a weather shock, uh, could spike up that price. I think I mentioned it last night. You know, I've heard you know, going up, you know, another another fifty percent, and so that's uh, that is not good. It's a bad thing. We've been we've been placed in that situation. That's why I. I, I tried to kind of sum up last night that we're in a leadership crisis here uh, with our current administration, and it is time for change. And I hope for Moners, uh, you know, I was saying going to bed last night, this ability to, to vote and let your voice be heard, uh, you know, that freedom is, 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 is an amazing thing. And I hope uh, for Moners get out and vote and vote with a conscience. Uh, I, I think it is time for change and it, 
it's been great meeting Vermonters uh, all over the state, you know, been all 14 counties and, uh, Another but getting back to what you said, we got to get some fiscal responsibility in there. We can't just keep spending like this. Another thing that came up, speaking of voting, um, uh, and, and your opponent uh, had mentioned this a couple times, was uh, uh, voting rights and reproductive freedom. Forgive me, I have to take notes. I worry about getting older. Uh, mm-hmm. Voting rights and reproductive freedom. When when you talk to the uh, the opposing side, it seems like voting <laughs> rights means everybody and anybody can and will vote and we're seeing we're seeing in in pennsylvania right now where the secretary of state is defying uh the supreme court and their own state laws about uh voter verification um on absentee ballots and and stuff like this and so we've got to have some kind of of a voting system where only honest votes, obviously, will be counted. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't have that problem up here, obviously, because everybody knows everybody. You walk into your town clerk's office, and and luckily, everybody knows everybody. And uh, and and the reproductive freedom, my, you know, that's another thing that the other side will never answer the question on. Uh, you know, there the two things can be true at the same time: uh, that most Americans, by a large margin, Want abortion abortion to be safe, legal, uh, and rare, okay, with the, with the exceptions. And uh, uh, on the other hand, most all Americans want some kind of time limit, you know. So I I, I thought you came you came through pretty good on that one. Uh, but one thing that really that really didn't uh, get covered much last night, and uh, did I was surprised. Uh, especially co- uh, from a, a news organization like CAX, was the government censorship. You mentioned uh, Section 230 and uh, Twitter. And I just found out last week that Fauci's daughter works for Twitter. Uh, I didn't know that before. Mm-hmm. And uh, the bots and the algorithms are one thing. But the, there are uh, like three states, I think maybe four, that are suing the federal government and the Biden administration for censorship, for working with these large tech platforms to to censor and and you know voices and it searches and uh, and to me, uh, somebody who does a, a weekly news show, uh, I mean censorship is the ultimate. If you don't, if you can't have an open exchange of ideas, then your voting rights are all out the window because you can't make a good decision. Yes, uh, that did come up last night, and I'm, I'm trying to think of the name. I actually uh, joined on with a uh, revision of Act 230, uh, Communications Decency Act, and I do think it needs to be revised, and I am looking for uh, free speech, uh, you know, to be maintained. Uh, um, uh, that's one thing. Yeah, so the uh, – and I, we did cover uh, – uh, reproductive rights. Uh, we did not get into Prop Five and Article Twenty Two last night, and I'd be willing to tell you, my, you know, my thoughts on that. And that that's a state issue looking to enshrine the current law, abortion up to the moment of birth, uh, into the Constitution. It's actually a lot more than that, and I am opposed to it. And I will be voting no against, it. and I've spoken against it many times. And I I, you know, I look at that as exactly what you were saying that um, you know I have my pro-life beliefs, uh, uh, but I, put those aside for a sec. I do think that most Vermonters, most Americans are not in favor of uh, third term, uh, third trimester abortions and that, that we should not be in, uh, you know, enshrining that uh, value, so to speak, into the Constitution. The Constitution really is represents the values of the people. And I don't think we should uh, be putting that into the Constitution. And, and there's even more to that. The way it's worded is um, it's 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 way too wide open. It, it, I actually think it starts to impact uh, many, many different areas and to include parental the rights of a parent uh, to make decisions for their children. And so uh, that's why I'm, I'm very much opposed to that. Uh, I did even mention, I think I mentioned last night, I mean, it, I said at the beginning of my campaign that I thought Roe v. Wade should be overturned by the 10th, via the 10th Amendment, that it, it's, it's bad uh, law. 
it, it is bad law. And it, that, you know, if it's, if, you know, exactly what it says in the Tenth Amendment, if it's not uh, uh, reserved elsewhere, it goes to the states and the people. And that's what happened. And I think that's the right thing. And, and so I'm not, not supportive of it coming back up to the federal level. Um, you know, I, despite my personal beliefs, I think, you know, I'm, I'm looking to act as a United States senator, in a, you know, support and defend the Constitution. So I don't think it belongs at the states. I think that and there are many different amendments people point to. But I think the overarching one, it, the easy, you know, the most straightforward one is the Tenth Amendment. It's a state issue. And that's what Justice Alito wrote in his uh, in his decision there. Yeah, going uh, we're, we've got a, we're down to about five minutes. We're going back mm-hmm. to energy. Uh, yep. uh, your opponent last night uh, mentioned a study. He didn't cite it. He mentioned <laughs> mentioned a study. He didn't cite it. That mm-hmm. uh, two thirds of Americans say they're not uh, that we're not doing enough on climate change, and it's like I never hear that in in conversations with people. Uh, I don't. You've been out all over the state, mm-hmm. crisscrossing it back and forth. Uh, to, it's uh and 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 for us to you know for for the U.S. and Europe to have to throttle back all of our energy demands and whatever, while countries like India and China are exempt because they're supposedly you know growing or whatever they call it, uh, it that's what comes up is is the cost of energy drives everything. Uh, I don't when I'm talking to people unless they're school kids who are freshly indoctrinated by, you know, the teachers union folks uh, to be scared of climate change. And they wonder why the suicide rates are so high. You know, if the teachers, if the teachers are telling kids that the country's was bad, it's been bad from the beginning, uh, that that your parents' ideas are are probably bad uh, uh, and that the climate change is going to kill a planet in 12 years. You know, they're, they're taught this stuff. And, and and yet they wonder why you have a, such a high youth suicide and opioid rate. I, yeah, Steve, I can comment on that. Um, <laughs> hit the nail right in the head. Well, I, I'll tell you one of the highlights of the whole 10, you know, 11 months campaigning. Williston Central School, 20 year tradition, brings all the candidates up for the major uh, offices. Uh, governor was right next to me. Uh, U.S. Senate, U.S. Rep, uh, State Attorney General, uh, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Governor. Um, and uh, eighth graders asked questions for an hour and a half. So it was fantastic. I mean, all the fifth graders, sixth graders, seventh graders, and the eighth graders go in and ask questions. I had three really insightful, informed questions from, uh, I think it was Avery and Orion and, uh, uh, and uh, Sierra. But what I was going to tell you is <laughs> the Democrat candidates lead, you know, response to almost every question doesn't matter what the question was the response was we're in a climate crisis existential threat right off the bat and i'm like come on yeah, these are eighth graders and, and show me the proof uh and and so that was that was hard to watch and i and i see it i i see it on the campaign trail i went to a forum here in windsor county with uh you know both party candidates and representatives and the, and then for the uh, state senate it's the same thing. And I'm like, uh, no, I mean, you know, I, I, I you know, if, if, give me a one page piece of paper with the proof, uh, you know, that we're in a crisis and, uh, you know, I'll read it and I'll, I'll observe it. It's got to be proof, though, not the weather's changing, you know, a little bit. And, and but uh, they were in a crisis because I don't think we are. And, and to inflict that amount of you know hardship on all Americans. And I hope Americans are actually looking at what's going on in the UK. Now, uh, you know, they're in trouble. And, and if you back that up, uh, much like right here in the United States now, uh, you start, you know, getting away from oil and gas and, you know, losing your independence and your capability. And you start spending billions and billions and millions of trillions on, you know, future energy that's, uh, uh, you know, government industry should be doing that you, you put your economy uh at, at risk and that's that's what we're doing now and it's it's i don't want to do that anymore and like the and like the u.s england england has uh they sit upon uh large deposits of coal uh they have they have gas but they banned fracking right. they have offshore oil off the north slope all the way from scotland to norway 
uh, you, you, so it, it is self-inflicted and it's killing their currency and they're in big trouble and we mm-hmm. could be too and it's all self-inflicted but we're uh it looks like uh my boss tells me we're hey can down. i show you one thing real quick sure you mentioned uh the gettysburg address i don't know if you could see that yeah that's that's up at st albans it's the most amazing picture I've, i think i've ever taken it's a selfie and that's the Gettysburg Address. I read it. I turned around to take a selfie. And you see the two children who walked in behind me? Yeah. It's Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream Come True. And yeah. Think- they, uh, uh, the St. Albans Raid. Uh, I've been to Gettysburg a bunch of times. I used to live in the Lehigh Valley. But um, it looks like we're out of time. I wish we had done and not scheduled an hour interview. But I'll come back. Happen. I'll come back next week or something, if you want. Yeah. After you're after you're elected, hopefully you won't forget about us up up here in no. the nether regions. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to uh, thank everybody for uh, for joining us and uh, vote early, vote often, as they always say. And, I can't uh, say that, but please vote and may the fourteen <laughs> stars shine bright. May God bless America. Yeah, well, thanks thanks for being with us, and thanks to everybody up in our viewing area, and uh, thanks to uh, Gerald Malloy, uh, our our senatorial candidate thanks for being with us it's nice to meet you nice to meet you too thank you steve yeah it's my pleasure